Good morning. I don't, that music, I don't know if it matched well with our sermon text, but that's where we're headed. Um, it's good, to, good, again, to see all of you. Just curious, anyone have a pet hamster growing up? Oh, don't worry, I'll make my point. Okay, fantastic. So some of us. Um, when I was young, I really wanted those things, but now I feel sorry for them. Uh, because a hamster often looks outside the glass uh, and sees its freedom. And then, in an effort to go for it, it jumps on the wheel and goes. And after it keeps going, it, it goes even further and faster and hopes that it can get out. And after about an hour of doing that, the hamster, poor hamster, goes and it go, notices that it can't get out and it runs to its little water bottle thing. And I mention that because in a lot of the ways that we see, in a lot of ways, a lot of us can live life like a hamster. Uh, we can be trapped by something, uh, whether it be held down by a belief system or held down by a, a force even darker. Martin Luther King, who often was a great orator, had another great quote, and what he said was that darkness can never be driven out by darkness. Only light can do that. And the hamster and the darkness both need somebody stronger, uh, somebody with the authority, with the key to reach down and pull the poor thing out, somebody who has both the strength and the authority to do that. Now, we've been looking at the Gospel of Luke, and we've looked at a lot of pictures of Christ's authority. We've seen his authority over uncleanliness when he touched the leper. We saw his authority over death when he spoke a word to a son who was completely dead. We saw his authority over physical creation when he rebuked the storms with a word. But there was a hallmark of Jesus' ministry. And that was his authority over the demonic. It was such an important part of his ministry that there was a messianic quote as ascribed to Jesus saying this, that he has been sent to proclaim the freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. Will you take your Bible and will you open it to Luke chapter 8 verses 26 through 39 this morning? Um, Luke 8, verses 26 to 39. And here, we're going to look at a man in bad shape. I know that's a little bit of an understatement, but he's in pretty bad shape. And I want to look at this text really under three headings. I want to look at it through the destructive power of the demonic. I want to look at Christ's freedom for the demonic-possessed man. And then I want to look, I look at the man's response. Well, let's jump right in. It begins here in verse 26, and it, they say that after dealing with the storms, Jesus and his disciples sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. Some of us may remember last week, but don't bother. I don't always remember what I ate last week. But if you remember, we'll know that the Gerasenes were part of the Decapolis, which was on the eastern side of the Jordan River. The Decapolis literally means ten cities. And they were ten Greek cities, both Greek culture, Greek speaking, and cities and areas that Jewish people, why would you go there? And Jesus sails there, and, and as he gets there, he meets a man who is completely overtaken by the demonic. Luke gives us quite an account of what's happening. Take a, take a look. In verse, eight, tw um, in verse 27, it says that, not, uh, it says, For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Now, brothers and sisters, we come to this text and we see what his predicament is now. But we got to look underneath it sometimes. What was this man's family like? Who did he leave behind? What did the demonic do to pull him out of his family and trap him in such a way? Mark goes a step further and tells us that this man was in such bad shape that he would routinely cut himself with stones and cry aloud. It's verse 29 is another sad verse. For mankind in the worldly wisdom tried at best to help him, but all they could do is just 
keep him trapped physically from harming anybody else. Look at the way Luke tells it. In verse 29, it says it like this. uh, Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and been driven by the demon into solitary places. I see this text, and this reminds me a little bit of the character Gollum from The Lord of the Rings, a fantastic uh, movie and narrative, and it speaks of a character, a man. He, we come to know him as Gollum, but if you follow the movies or if you follow the books, you know that it wasn't always like that. He started out as a regular man, but what happened was a desire uh, for the one ring of power uh, overtook him. And by the time we come to see him in the movies or in the books, his whole appearance has changed. Instead of the uh, lush uh, black locks of a hobbit, he has these wispy, disgusting-looking hairs. At the same time, uh, the force and the power of the desire for the ring has sucked all the life out of him. You can see the man looks like a dinosaur. You can see all the rib cages and every spot and every bone in his body. He lives in bogs and caves and tombs in the story. And he has cuts over them. Interesting thing, though, as you follow the Lord of the Rings, what you discover is that the dark power of the ring began to destroy him from the inside out. And in the same way, what we see is that the dark power of the demonic began to destroy this man from the inside out. What type of things was he mixed up in in order to get like this? Luke doesn't tell us, but we see this text, and it makes me ask the question, what can the demonic do to us? This is an important text in our cultural moment. We're living at a time where our mainstream culture is becoming more and more, oh, uh, friendly to the things of the occult, to the things of the demonic. Uh, I was reading an article on, on NBC News, it said by 2050, now, you know, listen, if not every statistic is correct, but by 2050, Americans practicing other religions, which would mean a, a religion other than Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, should triple, largely due to the switch to the religions of the New Age. Who saw the Grammys last week? If you didn't see the Grammys, I'm sure you saw it on TikTok. One of the um, winners of the Grammy, Sam Smith, is quite a good singer. Uh, and Kim Petras uh, had a full-blown uh, act where they highlighted and sang their debut single, Unholy. And if you take a look at it, what you'll see is none other than a straight-up satanic-type ritual, uh, glorifying uh, sex, uh, glorifying that of the demonic, just out in front. And it's sponsored by private companies. You have political dignitaries going there and co-signing it. Sometimes I go to Barnes and Noble too because it's a safe place to let Elsie run. But it's becoming less safe because I open up the door and you'll see on the end caps the, the items that are for sale. And what you'll see is a make your own tarot deck. Since when have we become so naive or become so open to these different things. What's really behind all this? That's obviously a bigger question than I can answer in one message, but there's a clue here in this article I read about a woman who switched from her faith to the new age. And what she said is this, and she said, the reason I like it is because you do not have to sign on to a set group of beliefs. You don't even have to commit to a group of people, and you get to mix and match as you see fit. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll pray to Michael the archangel for protection while I recite a prayer and make offerings of wine, bay leaves, and cloves. At the same time, if that doesn't work, I will light candles to the Roman goddess Diana at every full moon and place small bundles of rosemary on my altar to honor the dead. The blending of faiths has been seamless for me, despite what traditional religious folks say. And so what's the point? In here in the Pacific Northwest, in a post-Christian, post-truth culture that has a 
challenging time even saying something is true or not. What we're seeing is an increase in these things. Now, how does that relate to us? It's first, what you need to know is that our faith is actually quite unique in the sense that only Christianity goes so far to say you can only worship one God. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament in Exodus 20, verse 3 and through 4. Uh, God tells the Israelites this, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And so we're unique in the sense that our faith has always proclaimed that mixing is not allowed and that you only worship one God. At the same time, the Bible also goes a step further and tells us that in addition to worshiping one God, we also have an enemy, uh, Satan himself. And in our present world, we're living in kind of a mix of two things. We are children of the light living in a dark world that's been given temporary authority to the evil one. And Paul the Apostle tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, that the struggles that you and I go against, uh, the annoying people that we run into, or the challenges that we have with our children are not really them, but there's something behind them. And Paul tells it to us like this, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the heavenly realms. Thanks for that. But the question I want to take a look at is how really do demons operate in our world? The Bible tells us that they thrive in really three conditions. One is darkness. Uh, another one is... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Thank you. Thank you. Another one is deception. The Bible tells us that uh, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And then the final one is death. And so, in our world, whenever you will see death, deception, and darkness, it's likely that you can also find spiritual darkness behind it. Now, am I saying that there's a demon behind Krispy Kreme donuts? No. You can't blame the demon for that one, folks. It's February. Keep, keep the New Year's resolutions. But what I do want to say flat-footed is that it's no surprise in our world that we are seeing an increase in the occult, an increase in the traps of drug use and addiction, an increase in the devaluation of human life, both the unborn and people being trafficked routinely, an increase in the mainstream worship of Satan, so much even an increase in the decriminalization of property and destruction. In, in seeing all this, it seems like it's increased even more since COVID, hasn't it? In, in seeing all this, you have to ask, well, I don't think there's a demon necessarily behind that. There does, and it does seem to be indicative of dark power. And so what I want to put take a look at is what then can demons do to me? First things first is they cannot possess us. And, and what I mean by that is they can't take full control like a puppet master. But what Scripture does say they can do is we can fall prey to their deceptions, even as Christians. How do we do that predominantly? Mainly by believing and letting certain lies control us. Letting false arguments have holds over us interesting that Colossians 2, 8, and 9, Paul says, see to it that none of you, and he's talking to a church, by the way, he's not talking to unbelievers, see to it that none of you are taken captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than Christ. In other words, in living in a confusing age, we can adopt and believe these same confusions and ride those implications to a very dark end. Have you ever been held down by a damning thought? Uh, have you ever had perhaps a hang-up that's far more than just a negative thought, but it's something that keeps coming around, uh, something that 
uh, is far worse than discouragement. It's more potent. But it's something that reminds you and, and seems to creep in as soon as things get worse. That is all possible and all part of the struggle we have in the Christian life. And so what we see very quickly at just this man is we see the destructive power of the demonic. The demons for this man have taken complete control over him. And while that can't happen to us, we ought to be alert because our culture is more open to engaging with those things that God says not to touch. And that even though we do have Christ, we can believe and follow deceptive philosophies that can pull us off of the glory of Christ and rob us from his authority. And yet, despite this man's predicament and despite the world we live in, this is not the last word. Thankfully, this man has a helper, the same one that's in us. And take a look at what happens. It says this, that the man then came in verse 28, when he saw Jesus... The demons cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. It's interesting he calls him the Most High God because in the Greek mind, the Greeks believed there were two forces. There were a, a demonic force that was equally powerful to a divine force. In other words, good and evil were the same strength. And there wasn't a good triumphing over evil or evil triumphing over good. It was two opposite but equal forces. And the demon, as soon as he sees Jesus, does he talk to Jesus like that? Do the many demons in this man look at Jesus and say, you're my equal? Absolutely not. What he says is he says, you are the son of the most high God. Again, Jesus hasn't even said a word, and the demons are completely in fear. And then what does our Lord begin to do? He puts a question to the demons, and take a look at what he says. In verse 30, he says, what's your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. This guy's in pretty bad shape. Uh, a legion is a group of about five to 6,000 soldiers. Which means that this man, there's different scholars, but this man had more than just one demon in him. He had many. It's likely that he had thousands upon him. And so it speaks to what kind of things he was mixed up in before he went ahead and saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jesus is speaking to the demons, they begin to ask for uh, a, um, concessions. In verse 31, it says, they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them into the abyss. The abyss is another world for the netherworld, but it's interesting that it's so bad that the demons don't even want to go home. That's how bad it is. It's so bad, they said, don't send us home, please. Please, Jesus, don't do it to us. But what does Jesus do? In verse 32, it says that a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and here's the key. He gave them permission. And brothers and sisters, that's what we need to see here, is that you have some thousands of demons to one man, and yet the man steps out onto the shore, and the demons are already backing up, asking for concessions, and Jesus has to give them permission. This speaks to the kind of authority that we read about and that we sung about. Is that it is consistent in the scriptures that Jesus Christ has complete authority over all demonic powers and destruction. And so what Jesus does is he gives them permission. And in verse 33 it says, When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. A lot of bacon and salami wasted that day. But what I want you to see here is the presence that Jesus causes is that the demons begin to quake at just his presence. Now, what does this mean for us? One of the things we have to see is that we preach about Christ coming to save our sins, but Christ also came, 1 John 3, 8, to destroy the works of the devil. 
That was one of the main reasons Jesus came. And, and one of the things that, as we see this image of Christ, that it should push us to is, and this is one that we know, but we can't ever not speak about too much, is that we're not to fear the demonic in the world we live in. Brothers and sisters, though we live in a dark world, the Bible is consistent that the people of Christ are not to fear. And why not? Because one of the things that Jesus does is he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He transferred us into the kingdom of the Son we love. And, and while we understand that, and while we know we're not to fear the demonic, it makes us ask the question, practically, what does the Bible tell us? And how are we to stand strong against demonic forces? Though we are living in this crazy world, how are we really to stand strong practically? And I've included a list here for you to write down. The first is, it's, it's, it's worth noting, and I'm not going to have you write down that whole verse of Scripture, but the Bible gives no step-by-step -step instruction. But if you take all the Scriptures together, what you'll see is essentially these steps. The first thing is the Scriptures tell us to avoid every contact with demonic movies, Ouija's, charms, seances, and games. And this is just a quote from Deuteronomy 18. Even the Moses warned God's people, when you enter the land the Lord your God's giving you, do not Im learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations. In other words, we're to first avoid these things. Why? Because they're indicative of forces that can, I'm not talking about good stories, that's different, but permanently trying to seek out and have touch with those things that are otherworldly are a no-no. Because in doing that, we're putting ourselves in a position to perhaps see somebody or something we don't want to see. And so the Bible co commands us to avoid it. But the second thing is, the Bible routinely says we're to resist Satan and meditate. Now, not the meditation of emptying our mind that we're taught. That's not the biblical meditation. But when the Bible talks about meditation, it's talking about filling your mind. Do you remember how Jesus thwarted the attacks of the devil? Did he fight fire with fire? No, what he did is he stood on the word of God. It was so bound into him that he had it meditated on his lips so that as he spoke it, he could uh, speak a greater authority than even the devil himself. And so the scriptures call us to avoid it. The scriptures also call us to meditate consistently on God's word. Then we're to pray. And another thing, we're to be in community. This is interesting here. Did you know that the church is actually proof that Jesus has defeated the dark powers. Take a look at this, Ephesians 3, 10, and 11. It said, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to the eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, the demons and the dark forces are to see the church of Christ, a completely new birthed people, and see in that proof that the demonic forces and attempts to destroy Christ and his people are finished. And so what we're to do is we're to avoid, to resist, to meditate, to pray, and to consistently be in community. And so what we see very quickly is that, while Christ, that Christ has defeated the demonic authorities on the cross, that Christ has defeated the demonic authorities with his power, and that because of Christ in us, we're not to fear. But our job isn't just to fear. We're also called to something else. And take a look at the responses in verses 34 and 39. After this crazy sight, it says that when those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people in this and the people went out and to uh, went out to see what had happened. They go down to verse 37, it says, Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them. It's kind of interesting. Why do you suppose that these people would ask Christ to leave? Could it be the great economic loss of the salamis finished and they are just terrified of what Jesus is going to do to them now? It's hard to know. This man would have been known. He would have been known around town. They would have seen this man 
be completely healed, and yet they don't want Jesus to be around? In some ways, unbelief is hard to understand. Have you ever come across and shared the light of Christ with somebody and they don't seem like they don't want it? John 3, 19 through 21 says it like this. It says that light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. In other words, there's a sense in which presenting light and presenting truth to people who don't want it, they're not initially going to be into it. And so when they see Jesus, they're not only terrified, but they say, dude, the, the bacon order is gone. Just, just leave because I don't know what else is going to be gone to. And so that's their response. But look at what happens to the man in question. Take back a look at what, how Luke describes what happens to him. In verse 35, it says, When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. The man goes from naked and afraid to dressed and in his right mind. He sits at the feet of Christ, a posture of, of learning, a posture of worship. But here's the proof of the man truly being saved. And look at what he says in verse 37. He says it like this. I'm sorry, verse 38. It says, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with Jesus. And Jesus said, nah, bruh, can't do that one to you. And what Jesus says, oh, he didn't say that, but that's my translation. That's the Hebrew. But what he did say is, Jesus said, it's the first time we ever see Jesus reject someone to follow him. And what Jesus says is, no, 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 no. I want you to follow me, but it's going to look a little bit different. You need to go home and share all that God has done for you. And what happens? Verse, 30, uh, it, verse 38 says, So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. And as we see this text, it makes us ask the question, okay, how are we to respond then? The first thing we're to see, brothers and sisters, is that it is imperative that you and I consistently go into our spheres of influence and share the gospel. You know why? Because it's likely that people are here and you're here before me because people were willing to share the truth of Christ with you. When I got saved, I heard it from a buddy of mine named Barnaby the only Christian in the philosophy department at San Francisco State. You know where he heard it from? His father was in North Korea. Heard it from missionaries who would go out to North Korea and share the truth of what God had done for them. And where did they hear it from, you suspect? Perhaps from their local churches. At the same time, I also routinely heard the gospel from my grandmother, who heard it from my uncle, who heard it from his Christian teacher, whose Christian teacher heard it from somebody else. And so, how important is it then for us to do our part, like this man, and go out and tell the truth of what Christ has done in us and for us? Brothers and sisters, God never tells us to win someone to the lost. We can't do that. But we need to be willing to go out. At the same time, I see another application that jumps out on the page. And that is that, it's very clear as we look at Jesus that he is able to break the chains of bondage still today. There are people here perhaps who are struggling with that. I'm sure, you're not running around like the garrison demoniac, running naked. I hope you don't do that. But there are people who are held down by different things. More subtle, actually. Uh, whether it be drugs or alcohol or sexual sin. Or whether it be depression, for something far worse than depression. It's not just that, but thoughts that have a way of pulling you down. Of robbing the authority. For that man who emailed me last week, I saw your email. And I hope by the grace of God, you're listening to this. And I hope that in listening to this, you know that Christ is totally able to break the bondage of the things that you're mixed up into as well. But what I want us to see... There's one more thing here. Go back to verse 26. It says, 
they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. Now go down to verse 40 if you have it in your Bible. And it says, now when Jesus returned. That's all I want you to see. We said that Luke in a sentence is this. The Son of Man went all the way out to seek and save the lost. Interesting that Jesus is willing to go all the way to the other side of the sea. To a place that people don't go to. He's willing to stop his ministry plans. He's willing to put a pause on the things of life to go all the way out to help one man who is totally destroyed by the demonic and then willing to go all the way home. That speaks to a God who is willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of people. Oh, brothers and sisters, that needs to preach to us this morning. For what we see today is that in this passage, yet again, Because Christ has defeated the demonic authorities, Christians can live and share the gospel without fear. And while we're living in a darker world, a world that increasingly is falling in love with the darkness, the scripture tells us that we need never fear it. We need never quake at the sound of it because greater is the one who is in you than he who is in the world. Oh, but there's a second thing, though. Martin Luther King again said, darkness can't be defeated by darkness. And and if we live in a continuously hostile world, then who is it that's going to shine the light? If Jesus is willing to go across the sea, my brother, are you willing to go across the conference room? If Jesus is willing to go across the sea, are you willing to go across the classroom? If Jesus is willing to go across the sea, To free someone, brothers and sisters, are you willing to go across the driveway? Let it be known that Christ wants us to be these emissaries of light that go out into our spheres of influence and tell what God has done. Are we going to be like that? I know we are. And so let us be like this man in question, sitting at the feet of Jesus every morning, sitting at the feet of Jesus every Sunday, and then coming out here and saying, where shall I go tell all that God has done for me? Let's pray now.